All right, hi everyone. This is chapter 12's lecture. Chapter 12 marks the uh, about the 75% of the way through the book material uh, point of the semester. So we are uh, closer to the end of the semester than you than you probably thought. We're almost there, guys. Hang in there. Uh, chapter 12 is about inventory management, and it leads directly into chapter 13. Uh, and just another warning, I, I know I've put the messages out there in uh, the announcement section and early on in class. If you're using the 13th edition of the textbook, chapter 12 and 13 are in reverse order in all the previous editions. We're on the 14th edition, and it's got chapter 12 uh, switched to where that's now inventory management. But if you're on the 13th edition of the textbook, you're going to be using chapter 13 instead of chapter 12 uh, on this week's material. All right, so a uh, lot of learning objectives in chapter 12. We're primarily gonna be focusing on two quantitative pieces um, with the problem sets this week. Uh, I'm gonna go over a third one in this lecture and then um, some of the other stuff is just gonna be skipped. I mean, this is a, this is a uh, principles of operations management class. Um, there is a lot more in here. Uh, if, if operations management is gonna be what you do as a career, it, it, it would behoove, behoove you to, uh, to um, read that closer and practice those practice problems that deal with the other methods here. All right, uh, to learn about inventory, we need to define inventory, which is a stock or store of goods. That's probably about what you expected. And then independent demand items are items that are ready to be sold or used right away. All right, a couple of definitions for you in case you get uh, quizzed on that. Now, inventory doesn't just mean that uh, it's your final goods like you would have on a retail store. Um, inventory can also include raw materials. So you've got inventory of, you know, um, whatever raw material it is that goes into what you're, what you're building. Uh, any purchase parts, if you buy the subcomponents, that's, that's inventory as well. Um, you've got a work in process inventory. So this is stuff that is in the process of being built. Um, this is especially, uh, this would come up a lot in um, a custom uh, custom shop, uh, job shop, where you're in the process of building some custom item. The finished good or inventory or merchandise, so something that's ready to be sold directly to the end user. Um, you could have an inventory of tools, supplies, um, and so on. It's not just the end product, right? I don't have inventory of just what's on the store shelves. It could be any of these other things listed here as well. Why do we stock inventory? Um, there's a number of reasons. One is to make sure we have customer demand covered. We have the raw materials we need at any point. We're not gonna run out and not be able to satisfy demands. Um, you know, to permit our operations uh, to, to uh, proceed at all, uh, number seven there. Uh, lot, lots of reasons we might, might uh, cover it, but number one, first and foremost, is to make sure we can meet demand. Uh, managing inventory has two main concerns, level of customer service. So the right goods, the right quantity, right place, right time. We're not out of stock of something. The customer goes and decides to buy it somewhere else. Now they're going to use that other cust that other uh, product going forward, or they're upset. Uh, they decide not to use this anymore, whatever the case is. Customer service, making sure we can um, meet the demand. And then we're also concerned with uh, the cost of ordering inventory and the cost of holding inventory or carrying inventory. Those are the same words as far as uh, we're concerned. You're going to see carrying and holding uh, used um, uh, uh, synonymously there. Um, it's the same word uh, as far as we're concerned. So cost of ordering inventory, cost of carrying inventory. Um, and then within that, there's some lower levels. Uh, we're worried, uh, worried about uh, performance, we're worried about customer satisfaction metrics, we're worried about inventory turnover. Uh, inventory turnover, if you've had your finance class, you've seen the inventory turnover ratio already. It's the ratio of, of the cost of goods sold compared to the average inventory investment. How many times we go through that inventory? It, it, it costs us so much to create that good, that's the cost of the goods sold. And then the average inventory, uh, so, so going through that, uh, better is or higher uh, ratio is better because it, it 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 shows that we are turning over that inventory, we're selling it, we're making use of that um, the monetary investment in the inventory, uh, and and uh, we're making efficient use of it. If we're going to manage our inventory well, we need to be able we need to have a system that helps us keep track of how much inventory we have. We need to be able to reliably forecast demands. That harkens back to chapter three. We need to know how much lead time we have and how much variability is there in lead time. Lead time is how long it takes us to get 
the subcomponent or raw material so that we can actually make the inventory. So if we need to reorder something, we need to know um, how long it takes to get that from our supplier so that we don't run out of it and then it shuts down our operations. We need to have a reasonable estimate of how much it costs to hold or carry inventory, how much it costs to order inventory, and how much it would cost us if we run out of inventory. And then we also uh, should have a classification system for inventory items. Um, this you'll see listed as an ABC metric, where A is your high, uh, high uh, value or high priority items and so on. We'll see that uh, coming up here. Inventory counting systems. Um, so we either are gonna count things periodically. So we're gonna count inventory at certain in intervals, like maybe once a month, once a week, once a day even, depending on what it could be, or perpetually. So um, we could have something where we are continuously monitoring and updating the inventory uh, automatically. And then uh, within a perpetual inventory system, we, have, we might have it set to where we automatically place uh, uh, reorders um, based on inventory dropping to a certain level. A two bin system within that would say, okay, we've got two I, two bins and we order one when the first one's empty. So we've got those, um, you know, uh, uh, set to the hold a certain amount where we know that it, as soon as we run out of one, we'll order the next one. I did something like this with reams of paper in, in an office setting. I would have, I would have, have uh, two of them on hand at all points. As soon as I ran out of uh, one or as soon as I used one up, I would order so I'd have that second one. I never wanted to not have a full one on hand because if I ever, we ever were out and we had to order it again from, uh, you know, our supplier instead of just from the uh, the surplus within the building, it might take a little while. So I never wanted to uh, actually use one of those reams of paper. I always wanted to have a full one at, uh, at all at all times. So uh, because we had receipts or whatever else we needed to print off, and I, and I had to have the paper. I could never. It would be devastating if I was out of it. So I had to make sure I always had it in play. Uh, some technologies that help us to count inventory include UPCs. UPCs have been around since, uh, you know, uh, before any of us were born. Uh, you know, the little barcode with the up and down um, black and white lines that you scan. All right. And then more recently, uh, but still might, you know, uh, depending on, on your age, might have been around before you were born, but likely not. RFID tags, so this is ra shortwave radio frequencies that help to tell you exactly where something is at any time. You could uh, pick something up and put it down somewhere else and it would tell you where it is. Um, we use RFID technology along with um, different kind of scanning technology in convenience stores. Uh, this is being tested. If you've ever been to the Quick Trip inside of the BOK uh, the BOK Tower, downtown Tulsa, you have seen this in play. You um, tag your, your RFID equipped credit card on a little uh, thing when you walk in, you walk around the store, you grab whatever you want, you walk out and there's RFID on some of the items and otherwise it tracks your movement throughout the store through the um, AI technology and through the, um, uh, the cameras to know exactly what you've picked up, you walk out and it charges your credit card that amount. So RFID tags let us use uh, um, uh, inventory in a way that for, you know, needs to not have the actual worker working. So uh, some very innovative use of that technology. And that comes from Amazon. Amazon tested with their own um, Amazon convenience stores and kind of licensed that to the Quick Trip uh, to, to make that uh, make that store there at the BOK Tower. It's really neat. If, you, if you're ever around downtown, you know, hop in and, and check it out if you can. All right, inventory costs. There's a lot of costs when it comes to inventory. Uh, we've got purchasing cost, holding cost, ordering cost, setup cost, and shortage cost. So purchasing cost is just the amount of the inventory itself. Um, holding cost or carrying it is an estimate of how long it would, how long it takes, how long it costs to hold on to the inventory and store it. Um, for a length of time. So throughout the year, it is, and we use an average of the inventory we have on, on hand to estimate the um, holding cost throughout the year. Ordering cost is just basically the cost of placing the order. This could be shipping cost or how much it costs to actually unload it or whatever the case is, shipping and handling effectively. And then if we're producing the item ourselves, setup cost would be how much it costs to actually get prepared for the job. This could be, um, you know, the cost to uh, pay people to do that. For example, um, uh, this is uh, the same as ordering costs when you're talking about economic or price of ordering or production. Uh, this is basically the same, uh, even the same letter is used in place of it in the equation. 
And then shortage costs are used um, if you uh, are stocked out. Um, so this could be how much your opportunity loss is, unrealized profit per unit if you run out of, of stock. Um, and we're going to circle back to these costs uh, in the um, uh, practice problem video and then a little bit later in these uh, slides. ABC system, we're not going to be doing any problems with ABC, but this could come, come up on a, on a quiz question. Uh, the idea is that your A items are about 10 to 20 percent of your total inventory, but they account for about 60 to 70 percent of your dollar value. They're very important. You cannot run out of those. And then it goes to figure B items are moderately important. And then C items are most of your inventory, 50 to 60 percent of, in, of your inventory. But you can see they only account for about 10 to 15 percent of the total dollar amount. Of, uh, of value you, you bring in from items sold from that inventory. Uh, cycle counting, I'm gonna go ahead and skip. Uh, I meant to take that slide out. All right, reorder point. How much, how, at what point do you reorder inventory? Well, it depends on if you, uh, it depends on your lead time. So it's a simple formula uh, based on the rate of demand, how, how much lead time you have. And then if there's variability in the demand or the degree to uh, how much your risk acceptance is, uh, you can factor that in and make a longer and longer equation that tells you exactly when to reorder. Um, but let's go ahead and look at it. Well, it's just simply the demand times your lead time. So for instance, if I'm using up uh, these items or selling these items, uh, whatever it is, at a rate of 25 per day, okay, and it takes me four days to get them back in stock to get have an order shipped to me, well, then my reorder point would be 100. Why is it 100? Well, I'm using 25 a day, and my lead time is uh, uh, four days, okay? So if I'm using 25 every day, then I'm going to use 25, 50, 75, and 100. So by the end of the fourth day, I've used up 100. So when I have 100 in stock, I need to place an order so that I have them back in stock when I run out, okay? So it's just your demand per day, per week, per month, whatever. And then lead time, which is in the same unit of measurement. So if this is demand per day, lead time needs to be in per day as well, if it's per week, same thing. So uh, multiply one by the other, easy. Now, if there is um, uh, un uncertainty involved where you, uh, you, know, you might run out, uh, you might have um, demand or lead time possibilities where, uh, um, you know, based on it being on the weekend and you're and, and they don't ship on the weekend, but you're open for business seven days a week, you might have some uh, uncertainty there. So you might want to keep a little bit of excess stock on hand. If that's the case, you just take your same uh, uh, equation, demand times lead time, and then add whatever the safety stock is. So if, I, if you're told that the safety stock is 20 items, right, I need to have a minimum of 20 on hand at all times, just in case for extra demand. Well, then we go back to this one, where it's four times 25 for 100. So your, your, your reorder point under uncertainty would be, with a, with a safety stock, would be 120. Okay, because you do your demand times lead time and then add your safety stock to that. Pretty simple algebraic equation. Uh, visualize, you can see that, um, you know, you, you, your normal lead time is, is this many days. So you can see that it... Um, I did, you know, would go from here to here. And, and after that many days, you should be, uh, uh, um, uh, you should be okay. But um, with the safety stock in play, sorry, it, without the safety stock, you, you would go down to this level within four days. With the safety stock, you basically arrive at, at this level here. Um, so your 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 running out point is the is the safety stock amount. That way, if there's if there's any um, variability in how long it takes to get it back in stock, at least you still have some stock. It goes down into this area instead of going below zero, and now you're or at zero. You've stocked out, and then um, your customers aren't happy. You can see the way this cycle works. You, your order quantity is here. Your usage rate goes down over time. You reorder. So order, use it, use it, use it, or sell it, sell it, sell it. Reorder here, receive it here, goes back up. Now you've got a full set of uh, inventory, use it over time, place the order, run out. Okay. And then again, if there's safety stock in play, then it just increases that, that uh, amount on hand.
how much safety stock to care uh carry well that depends on how much customer service level you want um there is an equation we're not going to cover it just know that you can apply service level to your um accepted demand of stock out risk and uh change the amount of safety stock accordingly in in the only quantitative question you, you're going to see um we're not going to factor this in but just know it might come up and i want you to have a vague or a, a general understanding that there that this service level can uh, change the stock safety stock level if you ha uh, are risk averse and you want to make sure that you've got customers covered. How much to order? Well, you can um, uh, use a fixed order interval method where you just place orders at a certain amount of time. So every this many, you know, days, weeks, whatever you place orders. Um, you might do that because there's a policy in place that encourages you to do that, or you might get some sort of discount. Um, if you've ever done a subscribe and save from Amazon Prime, you know that you save a little bit of money if you order where you get uh, another shipment every month. Maybe you've got uh, babies at home and, and it reorders diapers every couple of weeks. Or um, like I, I have one subscribe and save and it's um, – uh, air filters for my house to, and what's nice about that is that it reminds me to change out my air filter so I have the the, the two air filters delivered every three months and then I, I I make sure I don't go any longer than that not of changing them out or or you know every uh two months every two months um you can see if you do a fixed quantity order uh then you are um restocking to a certain amount and hopefully you don't go below the uh, say you don't go below the you don't, you don't run out of inventory you might dip a little bit into your safety stock you can see that with a fixed interval if demand fluctuates you might go deeper and deeper into your safety stock so a little closer to running out um, but it might be worth the risk because you save money throughout the year otherwise this is just you have to do the assessment on cost all right, now we're going to get into a little bit of the quantitative uh, methods we're going to be using in uh, primarily in the in the problem set this week, which is EOQ, and then uh, the next one is EPQ. This is the economic order quantity, and, and then after that, it's economic production quantity. So if we have to order the, the um, parts or if we're produ producing them, there's a slight variation on the, um, on the formula, but uh, pretty similar overall. The idea is to minimize your total costs, um, and it and we do that by figuring out the exact amount to order, and then how many times uh, a year to order that exact amount. Uh, and it should and it's it it gets you to an exact amount. Now sometimes that exact amount isn't um, practical because well it's not a whole number right that's impractical. Uh, and sometimes it's not, you know, you know, maybe if the amount was uh, 1,006, you probably would just order 1,000 instead and then adjust the amount of times you order, right? Uh, it's just more practical that way instead of having an odd amount. So you can, uh, you know, round that to a uh, better number. It can be used approximately. Um, but when we do the quantitative methods on it, we look at the exact EOQ, exact EPQ, and then see the total cost based on that exact amount. Now, of, of course, yes, you'll, you'll adjust it up and down a little bit. So it, it, it can be adjusted for practicality. Um, all right, so basic EOQ, basic EPQ is what we're going to look at. Basic EOQ, uh, economic order quantity amount, assumes that there's only one product you're ordering. Uh, you have to do this for separately for various products. Um, we know the annual demand. We have to know that amount or we can't do this method. Um, we have to assume the demand is even throughout the year. So this doesn't work great if you are in a, um, a, some, a industry that's seasonal demand. Um, with the EOQ, we have to assume that the lead time will not vary. It'll be the same lead time uh, every time. Um, when we place an order, we get a single delivery so that it doesn't increase our order cost. And then we assume that we're not going to get a discount if we were to order more. If there's discounts involved, then there's an entirely different method altogether because it uh, encourages you to order more. And, and hopefully that order amount discount won't outweigh the cost of holding excess inventory. All right. That's something you just have to uh, do the analysis on. So uh, 
this is going to be covered a lot in, again, the practice problems video. I'm going to go through this briefly, but the idea is you've got a total cost and the total cost is equal to the holding cost throughout the year plus the ordering cost throughout the year. And you just plug in various numbers into this formula that, uh, so once you find the economic order quantity amount, you just uh, abbreviate it as Q, the quantity. Quantity divided by two times whatever your holding cost is per unit. That tells you your annual holding cost. Uh, demand, annual demand throughout the year divided by that same Q and then multiplied by the average uh, or the ordering cost per order. And uh, what's neat about this for the total cost is that if you have found the actual EOQ amount, the total, uh, the annual holding cost and the annual ordering cost will be the same amount. We are looking for an amount where on this slide you can see that over time the ordering costs are going down over time the holding costs are going up but the quantity that you order uh, will be the exact amount where those holding and ordering costs cross over on the grid so if you're doing you're finding total cost and your holding costs and your ordering costs are not the same amounts when you add them uh, individually add them together then uh, you probably didn't find Q correctly. Now, it might not be the exact amount because of rounding. You might round to the nearest whole number, so it's off by a few dollars either way. But as long as it looks to be pretty much the same, you're, you're probably good on Q. If you're off by a few dollars, that's expected. If you don't round it at all, then it, it, they should be exactly the same dollar though. Uh, to find that Q amount, um, we take this formula here, and this is just a longer version of that same formula, spelling out what these abbreviations are for. But it's two times the, it's the square root of two times the annual demand times the order cost divided by the annual holding cost. So it may look complicated, it's really not. You do two times this, times this, divide by this, and then just hit the square root and put it on your, on your calculator. Uh, it's just, a, it's very few inputs. Uh, it, this is not a complicated formula. Uh, once you do it, you'll see that. And once you see it done on the practice problems video, you'll see that this is not uh, complicated. Uh, just that we haven't been doing square roots a lot in this class. So it just looks like something new that might be uh, complicated, but uh, it's not. Two times this times this divided by this and then hit your square root button. And most of the time, all of these numbers are just given to you. Demand, ordering cost, holding cost, they're just given to you. Just plug it in. Two times this times this divided by this, hit your square root button and, and you're good to go. Economic production quantity, um, same deal as EOQ, except that this is all about producing the good yourself. And then there's startup costs for you for it. Um, you're, you're producing a certain amount per day. There's only, you only have the capability to produce a certain amount a day. You don't have unlimited ordering capabilities like you might with order uh, with the EOQ method. Uh, and so we have to know the annual demand, but also figure out what our daily demand is and what our daily production is. That way we plug in those numbers into the formula, which is a little bit different. Um, but you're using up throughout, you know, every day you're using up. So you go on what's, what's known as a run where you produce for so much time and then you're done with that production and you, you have enough inventory left over to last you for another couple of weeks or whatever amount of time it is. And then you have to do another run and another run and then and then throughout that run you have to pr produce more than you're using up every day so that you have an inventory on hand to last you a certain amount of time uh follows a certain a same similar method you, you've got production over time but then you have to be able to um, stock a certain amount so that you can use it up and then go on another production run and then use it up and then go on another production run etc with EPQ, the total cost is a little bit different. I mean, it's still equal to your carrying cost, but set of costs, that didn't change. But there's a slightly different formula for um, holding costs. So it, unlike EOQ, the carrying cost and and, um, and uh, set of costs instead of ordering costs, they, they're not going to always be uh, equal. They might be, but... Um, you don't get have the same extra thing where you can see, oh, this is equal to this, and so uh, we're good. It does not follow that same curve where they cross over. Uh, and don't don't threat, um, sweat too much on this uh, until you watch the uh, practice problems video. I go into more detail on what what all this means. Uh, the EPQ method is very similar to the EOQ method's formula. You find this amount still, but then you multiply it by this amount. Okay. Um, this is the amount you produce every day, 
and then you divide it by the amount you produce every day time, uh, minus the amount used every day. So you find that and find the square root of that. Once you do that, you multiply it by that same EOQ formula. So basically find this, find this, and then multiply them together. Again, uh, we'll go over that in detail on the, on the other video. Um, some other stuff you would want to know during this method would be uh, the amount of time uh, uh, it takes to, uh, to complete one cycle. So your runtime and then how much that lasts you for that cycle. And then uh, how long that runtime lasts, you want to know that. And then the, the maximum amount of inventory, the, the, the peak of, of your production, how much inventory you have on hand before it starts to get used up again. You need to know that amount to plug into uh, your cost amounts. So that's the lecture for chapter 12. Thanks, everybody. We'll see you in the practice problems video.